Good morning, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to day two of MYS. We're here in Denver, Colorado. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with John Furrier for our, our second day of awesome learnings and outstanding guests. Well, we got a famous author here uh, on theCUBE. Give us a lowdown on the defender's advantage and among other things, so. I know, I'm very excited. Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Very busy week for you, though, at least in your home state of Colorado. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm glad that you guys came to my home state and we'll come that. hang out with you anytime. Awesome. I saw signage for your book on the way in this morning. I'm very excited to be holding on to it right now. We have The Defender's Advantage. I believe this is the second edition of the book. That correct? is the second edition, yes. So what's going on in here? What is everyone going to learn? Well, first I want to say that there's about 40 contributors to this. So I'm one of the authors, but this comes out of Mandiant. So That's Mandiant's an amazing collaboration. Yeah. 40 yes. writers on one thing, that in itself is a, is a sign of the collaboration in the cybersecurity yes, community. <laughs> exactly. And um, so, so what it is is, you know, Mandiant sees organizations on their worst days. You know, we see what they're going through, how they're going to recover, how they're going to stop the breaches. Um, so we've taken that knowledge and worked backwards to say if organizations only put their, you know, did their operations this way, they could maybe avoid that worst day or, um, you know, minimize the impact of that pain, really. You're like the ER doctors. Yeah. Uh, it's the work backwards of, of the security world. Take yeah. these two pills and calls in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the uh, key themes that come through in this? Some of the big mistakes that people have made or situations they found themselves in? Yeah, well, one of the things, the, the book itself is structured into six critical functions. And the first one is intelligence. So what we see is organizations that are just doing things. They've, they've set up a SIM, they maybe have some EDR solutions, and that's all that they're doing. They're not intelligence-led. They're, they're not looking, they don't know who's even targeting them. They don't, you're not going to be able to fight unless you have that intelligence to drive it. So intelligence is the first critical function, which then informs the other uh, five critical functions. Um, so that's one thing that we see. Another thing that we highlight in there is response, and how a lot of, uh, you can do a response very poorly. Um, a lot of people say, oh my gosh, worst day, start making changes immediately. Not knowing exactly what to do yeah. makes it worse. It's going to yeah. make the impact of that breach yeah. much, much worse. You know, Kerry, at the keynote yesterday, uh, first of all, Kevin's keynote, so I'm a big fan of, he's always on point. One of the things he said, I want to get your reaction to, he said, the question he said, what do CEOs wish they did before the breach? It's one of his questions he brings up. Um, and it's interesting, his answer was resilience, uh, recovery. Yep. And I'm like, we're like back in recovery, like back in recovery on the main stage, cyber resilience has evolved. What do people think about when they get that mulligan, to use the golf metaphor, or that opportunity to look back and say, okay, what would I work backwards from if I can get a do-over? Right. What's, what's the common dialogue? What's the post-mortem? What's the analysis? Uh, what's interesting, it's, it's never about technology. That, that <laughs> you know, going back to that mulligan situation, it's never, tech, they don't bring up technology. They say, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known. I wish I would have practiced this. So, you know, doing a tabletop exercise is probably the easiest thing that you could do to practice, oh no. Um, and not just from the technology standpoint of how you're going to fix, you know, fix your environment, but how are the executives going to communicate? How are you going to, you know, got one chance to make your statement to the public. You want to make sure that it's right. How are yeah. you going to do that? Um, working with cyber insurers, when do you want to bring them in? Your legal counsel. These are things that are not necessarily top of mind yeah. until somebody's breached and they say, oh shoot, I wish I would have had that lined up. He said, do more red teaming. He loves the tabletops because he yep. obviously emphasized the hell out of that. Um, but he said a term, maybe I wrote it down wrong, but it, I think he said practice red lever events. Or, I mean, uh, is, is there, what was he kind of going with this? Simulation I get. Did he mean like target certain events that happen over again? I mean, what does a red, what does red teaming simulation mean if you have the opportunity to do that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what the red lever is, but red teaming, it's not just, um, you know, oh no, we got breached. It's how we got breached in a certain scenario. So just because you've walked through a ransomware, uh, you know, yeah. it, uh, red teaming engagement, um, you know, you need to do other ones too. You need to look at your critical infrastructure. Um, we have a, an ICS team that says, everybody knows that they're a, 
or <laughs> nobody knows that they're an ICS company, but they all are, because they're all using this operational technology. Um, so it's making sure they're practicing all of these things, because they're all different. Common threads, but different in how you're going to react. So the question that I get a lot is, what's the difference between cyber defense and security operations? We got a team that does this, but now we have a threat intelligence defense team. Yep. How, how do you describe that? How do organizations look at that? What's your, what's your take on that? So, I've been in the industry a long time, and a lot of times people just want to group everything into, well, I have a SOC. It's fine. Um, cyber defense is so much more. Cyber defense is that intelligence, um, whether you're curating that in, inside your organization or you're bringing it in from a partner. Um, it's that crisis communications. How are you going to talk to other organizations? One of the critical functions in the book is called mission control. And in that, it's how are the, how are the different critical functions in the cyber defense org going to talk to each other? But how are you going to communicate outside? Um, so well beyond just the identify, investigate, mitigate inside of a SOC. Explain the mission control. I think that's a really key point because stake there's many stakeholders, yes. but this coordination. Can you just d double click on that? Yeah, the, the mission control function um, typically is made up of people, resources from the different critical functions that come together. This is where you're going to come up with your processes, your procedures, your communication plans. Um, but during a major incident, they're really that center, that brain of, they need their hand on the you know, finger on the pulse, they need to know what's going on, and they're the orchestrators. Yeah. Uh, and so one of the big things about mission control is making sure that they have the authority to act. Because a lot of times what we can see in breaches is um, the security team knows that a technical control needs to be fixed. The IT team doesn't seem to think it has as much urgency as the security team does. So giving that mission control the authority to act and say, we need to do this right now, understanding the business, um, that's all part of that mission control. Absolutely, and understanding we're in a special circumstance right now where the traditional day-to-day -day processes may not be the process right. or the, the standard. You brought up something that we haven't had a chance to talk enough about this week that really tickles me. I've done, uh, in my other life, I've done a lot of severe crisis communications. And and I, I love that you just touched on that because you're right, you get one chance yep. to say the right thing. And I'll just speak for myself in this scenario. We see the ball dropped in that particular step a lot of the time, or that ball dropped very incompassionately towards those affected users yes. because someone is trying to be reticent or or coy about how severe a breach was. The reality is if it's going to affect the end user, we're all going to find out anyway. Right. So how do you help people prep for when that moment might happen or coach them through that when they intersect you when it's happening? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's um, you know basic communication plans. Who are the stakeholders? Who needs to be involved? Telling them examples of, you know, here's one company that handled a breach in their communications one way, and this was the effect, and it was terrible. Here's a, here's a good way to handle it. Um, so those examples really help people sit, you know, settle in. Um, you know, we have organizations that, that run to say, oh gosh, we want full transparency, we're gonna tell you everything we know. And while you want to get uh, information across, you don't want to jump to that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so coming up with who are the stakeholders, how are you going to do it? You know, maybe running through some scenarios just like a tabletop. Um, and then sometimes you can, you know, pre-script some things. And then one example of something that you can do very, very easily is set up a, um, if there's a breach, you want one place where the message is. So know where that place is going to be, whether it's on your website, probably, because what you don't want is to send out an email to every one of your 20,000 employees and say, here's your talking points. You do not want them Oof. talking. They just gave my the comments and yeah. chill to hear you say that. There's a web link. Now find out. Yeah. And <laughs> or just an hairy tweet or whatever, you know, right. there's a lot that can happen there. Yeah. Right. yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So same with that mission control, central point of communication. Yep. I got to ask you, because one of the things that always comes up every year, the, the surface area is expanding, Gen AI is, is a, is a dream scenario for yeah. uh, on both sides. Even the defenders are commercializing it. Certainly ransomware has got product market fit for a long time. Yeah. They're doubling down, ransomware as a service, exfiltration, other extortion, mecha selling data back. So EDR yesterday we talked about, but then we said, okay, if there's no E, what else is there? So now there's detection and response. Situationally, there's other things going on in the world. What's behind that API, that SaaS vendor? Um, you have interconnections now with, with the data. Um, a lot of new, new patterns of traversing through with distributed computing architectures from network, from silicon all the way up to the app. What is that blank 
EDR, get EDR endpoint protection, everyone kind of gets that. How do you guys look at that? Because it's, I, I can imagine it's an important part of the defense intelligence piece to be aware of, you know, fill in that, that letter. Yeah, right. I mean, and, oh. and the world is still trying to figure all this out. So what I'm saying today may not be the answer that I would tell you five days from now. Um, that's an honest way of phrasing it, though. We'll call you five years from now. It's iterative, though. That's that's important. Oh, one. It's, it's a big part of the industry. Uh, yeah. yeah, but what I would say is, you know, just like the adoption of cloud or the adoption of you know mobile mobile apps, yeah. we've we've seen this before. You know, we've seen technology come yeah. along, and so there's certain things that we we already know how to do. Your training data is uh, you know your crown jewels. So how are you going to protect your yeah. crown jewels? Just like you do in the cloud, just like you do yeah. anywhere else. Um, you know, we're building applications on top of the AI models. You need to test out those applications just like we do yeah. mobile apps. Um, so we need to take the lessons of, we've seen this episode before. Yeah. Let's make sure that we're applying that. Um, and then we'll see if there's technologies that come out that are that blank I mean, ER. I mean, the application security app sec reviews have been happening. Correct. Okay, now it's just another extension. It's a new element. Is there any observations that you can observe as Gen AI comes in? Is there any function, intrinsic new things popping out of that review process that <laughs> people should pay attention to? Well, right now when we're doing our assessments, um, you know, big things that come out are governance. Oh goodness, how are we going to put the guardrails on? We don't want to tell developers yeah. no. Again, we've seen this episode. Yeah. One of the harder conversations in a not traditionally sexy space right now is oh, governance. Yeah, totally. it's a fun time actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, can we just block it out? No, you can't just block it out. Yeah. Um, one of the things that comes out is uh, if you have a third party app that you're using, it's a black box. There's no logging that comes out of it. You don't know what happens. Um, we had a I had a conversation with someone who was working with a third party vendor. They got their application, something went wrong and they couldn't see inside of it, so then they had to go and pay more funds to the vendor to you know, get access to what they needed to see. Not good. Yeah. <laughs> clunky. Yeah, that, it's a little bit clunky. Yeah. Um, what are some other themes that are coming up? A lot of it's around that data, that uh, crown jewels, yeah, the data. data security. And then what we find during our assessments is if you have poor IT security, you're definitely going to have poor yeah, yeah. AI security. Yeah. I mean, process is a big thing. I mean, adopting a new tech stack is one thing, but understanding the new process is, becomes another one, to your point. Right. Just because IT ran LAMP stacks in the old two decades ago, and they got to bolt on some front end. Right. I mean, like, poor design. So is that whole design architecture being re-looked at? I mean, we're seeing an inflection point now with you know, the silicon work being done around AI clusters, so a lot of infrastructure work's going on around more supercomputing-like mm -hmm. for the masses. So yep. very much a democratization trend coming. Does that help you guys out in the, in the field and the intelligence side? Because, I mean, more horsepower, more data crunching. Right. What's your, what's your take on that? Because I know it's really off, the, off topic, but it is relevant. You can process the data faster and then do better reasoning and, right. you know, inference. I mean, there. There is the, they go, they go faster, we go faster, they go faster, yeah. we go faster. As simple <laughs> as that. Um, but one of the things that we don't know yet are all the use cases. So, um, you know, I used to be in application security. I used to tear them apart, right? Yeah. Before that, I was an application developer. Yeah. I made things work. It wasn't until I got into security that I was like, oh no, this is all the ways that it couldn't work. So I think with AI, we're, yeah. we know we're learning from the past. We know how to make our AI systems, um, our, our platforms yes. secure. Um, but it's the, what are all the use cases? Yeah. How, how is it going to be used? We don't know. And that's why in five days from now, the answers may be different. So you, the book is written, second edition. You mentioned things are changing fast. And the one topic, five days, we'll call you, maybe ping you on LinkedIn. <laughs> What, what is, if, as this book is getting ready for the third chap, third revision, is there anything popping on your plate now that you say, okay, I'm starting to pull some stuff in, start getting my thoughts and wrangling some, some data concepts together, if that's for the next edition. What's going to be on in your horizon here in that book? Well, what we've done right now is we've done um, a supple su supplement document that's all about AI, how defenders are using AI, and not just AI is built into this tool or that tool, but hey, let's get let's get down and dirty and let's figure yeah. out you know how you're going to write a rule here and a rule there. Um, we also did one on OT security because I think that that's highly overlooked. 
Yeah. Um, you know, the industry is kind of, it's, it runs most of our trade around the world. They run so, a lot of old Windows applications. So, so that's, <laughs> that's actually that's a great point you just brought up. Yeah. And the, the other thing is, um, you know, starting to, we, we launched the first edition three years ago. So we actually have feedback from the readers that have implemented it and really, you know, brought it into their organizations. And so pulling that into, here's how people are using it. And if they're different size organizations, they use it differently. So large yeah. organizations have gotten feedback that it's, a, it's an operating model. They said, well, I was already doing all this before. It just wasn't organized and I didn't know how to talk about it. And if they organize like this, they can figure out where the apps are. And so it's, it's really interesting to yeah, yeah, they're using it. You know, it's interesting. Yesterday, again, a couple dots connected for us on theCUBE was, you know, there's a, there are playbooks and there's the formulas and mechanisms, software, technologies, but the idea of being craftful, situational awareness, understanding uh, what's out there, having a security mindset, threat, and threat intelligence first. So what's the craftsmanship of the, what is the, what is the train craft that's the creative side of it? I use the word R yesterday, but I used the right, it wasn't the right word, but like, I'll say, I can, I can follow a playbook. You got scolded on that one. Well, I, I don't get that pretty fast, trust me yeah. on that one. I mean, I didn't mean like you're painting art, but, <laughs> but there's, you got to look at data, you can't just, you got formulas, but it's craftful. You got to like situationally aware and then make calls, right? Yep. And, and it's not, it's not a checklist. You know, it's a, yes, these are capabilities that you should have within the six functions, but then you gotta ask yourself why. Why do I actually need these things? Well, because this triggers this, triggers that, and then, you know, hopefully avoiding that worst day. But it's really that, the creativity of saying, why are we actually doing this? And that's what's laid out in the book. This is why they need to work together. What's been the biggest feedback from people obviously operating it? Um, has there been some suggestions uh, any other kind of commentary on, on the book from people implementing it, reading it, and, yeah. and diving the, in? The first book, we were told that we need more. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which when, when I first suggested, hey guys, we're going to write a book, it was nobody reads books anymore. Okay. Why would you do that? Yeah, I yeah. read books all the time. Well, we should so, video series too, match it up with video. Well, it's really digestible well, it's size. Yeah. Too. I mean, I feel like this, it becomes actionable. Right. I right. won't say who it was, but somebody recently I mean, published a book about AI architecture, and it's so thick and so dense, and I thought, lovingly, it is only the academics and researchers amongst us that would right. ever get through this, whereas it feels like anyone could read it. Yes. Which I like. It, you, you've, you've made this digestible, which in cybersecurity is one of the more important bridges, I think, for us right. helping secure smaller companies, too, not just enterprise. Yeah. If you're a startup and you don't have the money, you've got to make sure you're doing the right things day one. Right. Well, I've gotten feedback from small um, organizations that say, you know, the, they are using it to justify budget. I was just wondering like, if it was ammunition for that. Yep. Is that so social proof? Hey, we do this and this and this, but next we need to do this. So yeah. it's it's driving their investments in their own programs. Well, I love the title. That, I, that's a movie title right there. It's definitely a mini series for sure. Uh, Defender, I can see the script right now playing out of my head. And the script <laughs> would, you like to, would you like to be cast as one of the characters? I think I want to get the movie rights for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, we are writing the script of cybersecurity evolution right now. I mean, it's, it is hot and heavy. The asymmetry battle continues. We hear it every year up on the keynote. Uh, like you said, it's game of leapfrog. Yep. Um, how are we doing? I mean, resilience is always elusive. The metrics behind it. Cyber resilience, a lot going on. Where are we? What, how would you peg the progress or status of the fight? Well, <laughs> we're better than we were 20 years ago, yeah. but so are the adversaries. Yeah. And so it's that leapfrog ability. Um, I've been in cybersecurity for quite a few years. Um, so from where I started, we are way far ahead um, of where we were. But with AI coming in, with um, you know more physical attacks, cyber physical attacks. We didn't see those 20 years ago. So um, I think as defenders, we're, there's a lot more collaboration in the industry yeah. as we see all around us. I think that's yeah. cool. super important. It's that's also really forward. refreshing. It is. It's such a theme across private, public, enterprise, smaller startups. Yep. Y'all are really coming to a, a true mind meld to protect the greater good. Yep. And it's also to see, it's also interesting to see um, get kind of the next generation coming. You know, there's people very excited about cybersecurity, which, you know, maybe before they didn't even know what cybersecurity really was. 
Yeah. Now everybody knows. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting to see, you know, the next generation coming up. Yeah, the game is yeah, new players coming yeah. out. Yeah. It was almost like, it was almost like in the before, cybersecurity didn't want you to know who cybersecurity was, right? It was, it was like that that VIP, invisible is safe sort of vibe. I'm curious, we've got a really big startup audience and we've talked a lot about enterprise. I suspect you know how to advise on both sides. If I'm an early stage company, what are the top three things I can do to at least evaluate my potential risk and threat landscape and build a foundation that could be evolved into continuing to be secure as we scale? Yeah, well, um, I'm assuming you're not starting at zero. So you got yeah. you got your firewalls, you got some EDRs in there. Let's assume there's a little bit going on. assume that there's a little bit going on. Um, one of the things that startups can always do is find partners for... 24-7 yeah. monitoring, that sort of thing. I think that's a really good investment when you have small organizations, you don't have Rent. the person who knows every single thing about cybersecurity, you know, find, find those partners. Um, the other thing is making sure that the head of the organization buys into, hey, this is really important. Here's, it's not just about ending up in the headlines, like this is actually going to affect your business if you don't do it right. Um, so those are, those are some of the first things to do. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say you need to run and, and invest millions and millions and millions of dollars into all of the technology, but ask yourself, like in the book, ask yourself why you're doing these things, mm -hmm. and then it will it will come, come yeah. up for you. I think that makes sense. Get that buy-in, it's going to matter all the way, yeah. and and understand what it is that you're, where, what matters most to your organization. Yep. I love it. Exactly. Harry, you've just been a wealth of insights <laughs> for us. I know that John and I will be reading The Defender's Advantage on the plane while John writes the movie script. It's fantastic. <laughs> you and the other 39 writers. That's right. Uh, obviously did a great job. Thank you for sharing this with us and for taking the time. John, always a pleasure sure. to plot future feature films with you. <laughs> and thank all of you for tuning in to our two days of coverage here in Denver, Colorado. We're at MWISE. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for cybersecurity news.